الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكبال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودع لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم وصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم العجم الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أهل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والله ما ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله والله ما جعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين رب العالمين in these few minutes that I have with you for this blessed day of Friday, I'd like to share with you a reminder of some fundamental concepts in our deen. Uh, commonly in English, we use the phrase enjoining the good, forbidding the evil. You've probably heard that phrase many, many times. Uh, it's inspired by a number of ayat, particularly from Surah Ali Imran, where يأمرون بالمعروف وينهون عن المنكر and تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر are used among other places in the Quran. Um, what I'm going to do is try to understand some of the vocabulary inside of this phrase a little bit more deeply so we have a better understanding of what that actually means. Because a lot of times, of course, we live in a time where everybody has a voice and they can project that voice by way of comments or posting a video or making themselves heard on any platform, any number of platforms. So now I have an ability to talk to the entire world and so do you. And anybody who says or does anything, there's, you know, uh, there's 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 every likulli kalam jawab. Every every speech has some commentary, right? So now we have an ability to record our commentaries, our mockery, our disagreement, our ridicule, our rage, our agreement, our appreciation. All of it permanently on these records that are under every YouTube video or under every post or anything else, right? So this is and and sometimes people do this in the name of I'm enjoining the good and forbidding the evil by, you know, calling, they, they, they listen to something or someone and they say, well, this person is a disbeliever or this person is completely off of, out of the fold of Islam or this person is calling to the way of shaitan, etc., etc., because we have to enjoin the good or forbid the evil. Or they'll exhort each other, hey, why don't you speak against this or why don't you speak about that because I want you to call this one out or that one out. And all of this is done in the spirit of something we think we understand for the most part, which is enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. So let's take these words apart a little bit uh, and, and break them up one at a time. Let's start first with the word amr, ta'murun, which in English translation, I don't, I don't personally like the translation enjoining because you don't normally use it. You don't use the word enjoin in your typical speech. The entire purpose of translation is to use language that's closer to your experience and that's not something you typically use. You don't enjoin your children to do the homework. You don't, your, your boss doesn't enjoin you to show up tomorrow on time etc. Right? So this is an alien word already for most of us. So let's use language that's more familiar. Amr can possibly be translated as a command. So one possible way of translating this word is commanding good. 
commanding good and forbidding evil, but even that has issues. And I want to share with you why that has issues. The word Amr in the Arabic language, you can think of it as an entire spectrum. One person is telling another person something, and if they have ultimate authority over them, like I have ultimate authority, let's say over my young child, that I'm commanding them to do something, that can actually constitute as an Amr. A general in a military is commanding a soldier, he's actually issuing an Amr. But actually, Amr is also used for suggestion. Amr is also used for advice in the Arabic language. In fact, not just in Arabic language and in classical poetry, but also in the Qur'an itself. When, when, when Fir'aun was losing his power, he was losing grip over his own cabinet, and he thought that they might switch and turn over to Musa a.s. side, he said, يُرِيدُ أَنْ يُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنْ أَرْضِكُمْ بِسِحْرِي فَمَاذَا تَأْمُرُونَ he, he wants to kick you out of your land. And he said, suggest to me what I should do. Give me your counsel, give me your advice. And the word for counsel and advice in that ayah is actually فَمَاذَا تَأْمُرُونَ The same word we're just learning about right now. He's asking for a suggestion. Similarly, when Musa is interestingly in his story, when he had punched that soldier and that soldier had died, فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ And the police authorities of Egypt were secretly taking counsel with each other and they figured out a plan and the plan was as soon as we find Musa, we'll kill him in the street. We're not going to bring him into trial. They had a secret meeting where they took each other's suggestions. And the word for that is the, the generals or the police chiefs are secretly taking each other's counsel and have reached the decision to try and kill you. This is the same word that's been used from the same origin in cases of divorce settlement between the husband and the wife if there's a child involved and how long the session should go on. Allah says, but tamiru baynakum bi ma'roof. That you should take each other's counsel and figure out what you're going to do in a dignified way. So the point that I'm trying to get at, not just from the point of view of outside of the Qur'an in Arabic literature in general, but also even inside the Qur'an, the word Amr doesn't just occur in the meaning of commanding. It actually occurs in the meaning of suggesting or advising or, in, you know, or encouraging or even on top of that, it can be in the meaning of commanding also. You know, so Allah Azza wa Jalla says, for example, Himself, يَأْمُرُكُمْ Allah commands you, Allah instructs you and to amanati ila ahliha that you give the, the, the rights to those who deserve them, the trust to those who deserve them. Now, this is an important distinction. What that means then, let me just give you in, by way of an example because talking in theory can become hard to understand. Let's say it's the first day of class and I have a bunch of students, third grade. Some of them are well behaved, some of them not so much, right? And some of them are struggling with, with discipline, some of them are not. I'm just beginning to understand these kids. It's going to take me a little while. And they're going to get used to my way of dealing with things and my discipline. And over time, I'm going to, I won't lay down the hammer at first. I'm going to try to figure out how everybody behaves and what their issues are and where their anger may be coming from, where their violent behavior in class might be coming from, why they're always so loud, why they're always, you know, get, you know, uh, being obnoxious, etc. So I might take one of those kids after class and say, hey, so I notice you make a lot of fun of your friends. Why do you think that is? You know, instead of embarrassing him in front of everybody, I'll take him to the side and talk to him a little bit. And then over time, I might see a change in that one student's behavior. Right? And then over time, as I develop a relationship with that student, the next time he's misbehaving, I can just say, Hey, Omar, sorry if there's Omar in the audience. Hey, Omar. And we'll just, you remember what we talked about? And he could just get it. He gets it now. Because we went from me slowly advising him, beginning to understand him, to a point where I can actually even just look at him and he'll know, Okay, okay. Sorry, Stad. Sorry. I know, I know, I know. And he gets it. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't, it, I couldn't do that the first day. And if I did, in fact, even if he obeyed me on the first day, he would develop a resentment towards me. And it's not something that would benefit him. If, if me as a teacher, I just want obedience in the classroom, I can get it. But if I want the student to actually transform and to see the error in their ways and to actually feel like I care about them, I'm actually doing this for their own good, then that's going to take some while. And I might not start with commanding. I might start with advising. I might start with suggesting. I might start with putting my hand over their shoulder, but with some compassion, some, some listening also from them. 
this is an important part of the process if I really have somebody else's well-being in mind. But if I just want to make sure I win an argument, then I can just throw some things in their face, threaten them to go take them to the principal's office, and I'll be done with it. My job is still done. I still taught a class. I didn't do anything illegal, right? But the point is, I'm missing something very, very fundamental. So that's a little bit about the word amr. And when we think about doing amr to something good, who am I doing it to? Do I care about this person or do I just want to win an argument? Do I want to embarrass this person, humiliate this person? Do I just want to show the world how wrong they are? What is my motivation for correcting them? What is my, and who am I saving? Right? And this becomes a really important question to ask myself when I'm embarking on a journey to correct somebody else or to advise somebody else. The other thing is when you meet someone for the first time and you're like, well, you know, before I become friends, what's your take on this issue, this issue, this issue, and this issue so I can gauge how much amr bil ma'roof I need to do with you before I can become, I can treat you as a dignified human being. Let me know your stance on all of these issues so we know where we stand exactly. That's not how human relationships work. You have to treat someone like a dignified human being and you're not in the back of your head. If you're thinking, I'm going to get to know this person a little better so that by the time I get to know them, then I'm going to drop some amr bil ma'roof on them. This is a very condescending, self-righteous, you've got it figured out and you need to save the rest of the world kind of attitude. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't consider yourselves so pure. وَأَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ التَّقَى Allah knows better who has taqwa. We, we've got this idea, we've got it figured out, everybody else needs to get on board, right? So there's that other attitude that comes with it. Now, this is the first part of the phrase. Then we say enjoining, which I kind of broke apart, amr. But then we use the word al-ma'roof. Ya'muruna bil-ma'roof. Or in this ayah, ta'muruna bil-ma'roof. Al-ma'roof we simply translate in the English language as good. But there's a lot more going on in this word than just good. The Arabic word for good is actually khayr. It's a very common word in the Arabic language for good and for that which is better. In fact, if you use al-khayr, it means the best. But al-ma'roof is what's called an ism maf'ul. So first, let's dig into the origin of this word. The word urf in Arabic actually means things that are normal in a society. So the urf of the Arabs, for example, was to wear a turban when they traveled or when they went into a new place and they'd cover their face in some of the tribes. That was their urf. That's the urf. The urf in Pakistan could be when you go to somebody's house, they offer you chai, 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 pani, shani first. That's their urf. Urf means the cultural norms of a society. Everybody knows this is the normal way to behave. When you go to, first time I went to, to Japan, I didn't know how the cashiers work. When, the, when they give you your change and your receipt, they do this. You know, they, they hand it to you and they kind of bow a little bit. Oh, what's going on? But that's just how they hand you their receipt. That's their urf. That's their norm. So it comes from that word. Then it's associated with things that are considered good. Things that are considered normal and good in a society are actually called urf. Now, from it we get the word irfan, recognition. Like, you know, when, you, when somebody's behaving like everybody else is behaving, you're recognizing that as normal behavior. If somebody's driving on the wrong side of the street, if you're used to driving in America, and you're like, I'm just going to drive on the right side of the street, and you end up in England, there's going to be a problem with the urf situation. Right? Because that's, that's not their urf. So everybody will recognize you as alien. You don't belong here. You don't know what you're doing here. This is not how we do things here. That's what's called unrecognized. And that's the Arabic word al-munkar, that which is not recognized. Ankara means to deny that you know someone. Nakir is someone who denies something. But anyway, com coming back to the word ma'roof, the ism maf'ul means things that are recognized. That muruna bil ma'roof, you are encouraging people to act on things that are recognized. Now, if somebody doesn't know any better, then they can't recognize it. If somebody doesn't have enough knowledge yet, then they can't recognize the right and wrong of something. You have to develop their knowledge of urf until it becomes ma'roof to them, then you can encourage them to do it. In other words, if a child doesn't even know that it's not a good thing to raise your voice, they don't even know that, then maybe the first thing is to develop that as part of their knowledge base and the more they learn now, that becomes ma'roof to them, known to them, recognized to them. Now you can encourage them to act on it. So the first piece in, in, in all of this, that muruna bil ma'roof, actually is an entire philosophy of education. You're supposed to raise the awareness of a community so they understand what good actually is. What good behavior actually, and then you can enforce it. 
And you cannot assume they already know. Some things we know. Some things Allah put as a ma'roof inside every human soul when He put us on this earth. Even a baby, well Allah says in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when He says, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ that every child is born on the fitra, the same fitra, the same nature that Allah describes in the Quran as fitrat Allah allati fatara nas wa alayha, the nature you know, created by Allah Himself, the one He molded people into, that nature inside a human being knows that it's, it's a good thing to be honest, it's a bad thing to lie, it's a bad thing to cheat, it's a bad thing to steal, it's a bad thing to hurt others, it's a bad thing to rob, you know? All of these things are known to human beings. This, you don't have to be a Muslim to know that. It's already ma'roof to everyone. So on those things, yes, of course we should advise. But within the scope of this deen, there are some things that not everybody knows yet. Not everybody understands. And the more I actually, is, is one thing, you know, people like myself, we have the microphone, so I, I'm speaking and you're listening. But you know, one of, the, one of the most educational things that someone like myself can do is actually listen to people to listen to them and learn from them. And when I listen to people, I realize where urf is. Like how much people know or don't know. And sometimes from the questions that I get, surprisingly, even in Muslim countries, I realize our youth are, are you know, like I just came from Pakistan where nearly 70% or even more of the population is under 28. Like they're very young. It's an insanely young country. And a lot of, they don't know. The kinds of questions they're asking, you would expect sometimes that somebody who's raised in a Muslim country would know some things. They don't, and I don't blame them. I don't, so if they're not acting on something that they don't even know and they don't even understand, then it's not their fault. Then our job is to raise the awareness so they can actually act on something. And then we can advise. But what we, what we see sometimes is people aren't acting on the value system that Allah has given. People aren't acting on the instructions of Allah and His Messenger Wasallam. So we have to condemn them and we have to go after them. We have to, and wait, hold on a second. Let's raise the bar a little first. Let's treat them like a human being first. You know, let's, let's dignify them first. Let's help, let's help them understand first. And you might be surprised how quickly they mature and grow into something that you won't even believe. I'll give you a shocking example of this that I read in the Tafsir of Surah An-Nur. Uh, Surah An-Nur was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a good 16, 16 to 18 years into revelation, right? So the Qur'an was revealed, most people here know, the Qur'an was revealed over 23 years, right? So almost 18 of those years are gone. So most of the Qur'an has already been revealed, right? And this is middle of the time that he was in Medina Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And a Sahabi comes to him. And a sahabi says that I want to get married to this woman. Right? This is in the opening surahs, the, the sabab al nuzul of the opening surahs of surat, ayat of Surah An-Nur. He says, I want to marry this woman. And what does she do? She's in a, and he says, I, because he was poor, he didn't have any wealth or money, and he was a wajir, so he wants to marry. And he says, well, she's in a questionable profession. You know, and I won't spell out what that is. But he didn't realize there's something wrong with that. That's how liberal or open that society was that somebody even suggested and he, he had to be told no you can't do that you can't marry a person like that and ayat came that you cannot marry people like that and the revelation came what does that tell you that sahabi was not condemned for asking that question he just didn't know yet he didn't know i'll give you another example all 23 years are done the entire quran nearly has been revealed makkah has been conquered Makkah has been conquered. Now there's no excuse. Everybody should know what's up. And in the middle of that, you know, the, the, the takeover of Makkah and shirk has been destroyed, the idols have been destroyed. Some guy gets out of his house and he's like, what's going on? He's like, I don't see no idols. What, what, does something change? You know, there's some people that are just playing PlayStation at home, regimes are changing, the sun rises and the sun falls and they're, they're just going to the next level and they're just beating their record. They're, they don't know what's going on in the outside world. But that happened... Guys at home chilling. Zahad happened, Ahzab happened. Makkah got conquered. He has no idea what's going on. He comes out one day and Muslims have taken over and he's like, uh, so what's this Islam thing? Like, can you, can you tell me a little bit about this Islam situation? Now the Muslims could say, uh, you had 23 years to figure this out. You, you get no more excuses. Makkah has gone to war with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam multiple times. 
now a, a, a mushrik in Makkah is saying, uh, I didn't know, please. Nope. What does Allah do in Surah At-Tawbah? Surah At-Tawbah that reveals, it's Allah reveals it without even the basmala. There's no rahmah in Surah At-Tawbah. And yet in that surah, what does Allah say? When أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكَ فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنًا when one of the mushrikeen comes to you and wants to seek your protect protection because he didn't know, then Allah says, give him protection until he gets to hear the speech of Allah and then take him somewhere where he feels safe. So he doesn't feel intimidated by the overwhelming force of the Muslims and he becomes Muslim because the Muslims have taken over. Take him somewhere safe, safe so he can figure this out for himself. That's because these were people who had no idea. Because they, their ma'roof hadn't been raised yet. They, did, they didn't know any better. When we say the phrase, ta'muruna bil ma'roof, it actually suggests that we are very aware of the people we're trying to help. We're also very aware of the lack sometimes of our own knowledge. And I'll come on the flip side of this now. One, one quick comment and I'll come on the flip side. One quick comment is that which is recognized. You see, I consider myself very much a student of Allah's book. Like I, I don't, I'm nowhere near a scholar. I know scholars and the more I get to know scholars, the more I realize how much nowhere near that I am. But I can tell you this, the journey of learning this deen is a journey of humility. The more you study it, the more you learn it, the more you recognize that you don't know much at all. And when you realize that, you don't find yourself in a position to lecture someone else on what they're doing right and wrong so easily. It's not that easy anymore you realize there are some things in which to the best of your understanding, you know this, but there are things that are مختلف fihi. There are things in which even the scholars were not explicitly clear or they had debates among themselves. So for if, if I see somebody with, let's just say, a beard length that is different from my own, let's just say I see somebody else with, you know, the, the, the pants above or below the ankles or something, and I say, you know what, I read, the, I googled this. I already saw five YouTube videos on this with people that have way better beards than you. And therefore, I know for a fact that this guy, because of the pair of jeans he's wearing, is going to the hellfire and I got to do Amr bin Ma'ruf. This is the kind of thing. You know what that illustrates? A, an absolute lack of humility to knowledge. An absolute lack of humility. In our mind, we're actually doing Amr bin Ma'ruf. But in reality, in reality, it's just projecting one's own ego. And it's also broadcasting one's own lack of knowledge and depth. It's just, that's why that's broadcasting. If I can just humble myself to what I don't know, if I can just simply humble myself to that, the depth and the richness of our tradition is that we shouldn't just be quick to pass judgments and, you know, pseudo fatwas because we've seen a couple of posts or we read a couple of articles. Well, how much time and knowledge have we spent? And then, on the flip side of that, are you saying you can't say anything is wrong? Everything's okay? You should just shut up? That's the flip side of it. So let's talk about the flip side of it. There are some things that are absolutely fundamentally right and wrong. And not just this deen, this is the religion of Ibrahim. Millata abikum Ibrahim. It's been passed down since then. And what is right will always be right. What is wrong will always be wrong. And you don't need to be a faqih or a scholar or a, a great student of ilm to know that. You have to be good to your parents, the best you can be. That's You don't need a degree in Sharia to know that. You have to speak to people with kindness and humility. I have to do that and you have to. You don't have to have exhaustive knowledge to know that. You don't have to know, like, ex, you know, exhaustive knowledge to know that, you know, the, the rights of inheritance, the rights of mahr, the importance of marriage, the importance of guarding chastity, all of those fundamental teachings that are not just given in this deen, they're actually a confirmation of what was already given in previous scriptures. It was known for millennia before Islam. It was ma'roof already. And then the Quran came and made it ma'roof all over again. In those things we have to speak up. In those things you have to raise your voice. Because that's not a specialization. That doesn't require a great deal of knowledge. That's that's ma'roof is ma'roof. If you're hanging out with a bunch of your friends and you're at their house, and his mother calls him and he says, Mom, I'm with my friends. Come on, you know I'm with my friends. Then you should slap him on the back of his head and say, Bro, that's your mother. Come on, don't do that. Go say sorry. You just did Amr bil Ma'roof. Because, You could do that to your friends. 
You want to wrestle? Let me wrestle him. That's fine. You know, because though there are contexts in which you should be enforcing good values. There are contexts in which you, oh, I'm not a scholar. I can't say you could talk however you want to your mom, bro. I'm, I'm not a fucking, you know, that's not what we're saying. That's not the point that's being made. So on the one hand, I have to become humble to what I don't know. If I don't have direct knowledge of something, then I shouldn't be talking about it. And so the last thing that I leave you with is actually tying this concept to another concept in the Quran, this idea of, you know, commanding good. I didn't even talk about forbidding evil, but commanding good or ta'muruna bil ma'ruf, suggesting that which is dignified. Another phrase in the Quran that I think everybody here knows because it's part of Surah Al-Asr is watawasaw bil haqq. Watawasaw bil haqq. It's a similar phrase. It's a similar concept. And it's a very beautiful phrase. I, we could talk about that for hours, but I'll just leave you with two things about that. Tawasi, tafa'ul in Arabic is reciprocity, meaning I do for you, you do for me. That's what that means. So tawasa means that I give you advice and actually you also give me advice. So if I'm so willing to give advice to person A, to person A then I'm actually equally will, willing to listen to advice from person A. Maybe I'm advising them about one thing, but they're in a position to advise me about something else. I don't consider myself an authority on advice. I'm equally eager to share something of benefit with someone, and I'm equally eager to listen to something that can benefit me. It's not going to hit my ego. It's not going to be, no, 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 no. I have al-haq. You unfortunately have al-batil. So I need to give you the haq, and then you just take and listen in and say thank you. No, 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 no. Tawasaw bil haq. They encourage each other, advise, advise each other, they care for each other, and they, they are bound to each other by counseling each other to what is true. This is a very powerful phrase. Because in that phrase, we're actually the, the scholar and the layperson, the elder and the youth, the mother and the daughter, they all in that sense become equal. Sometimes a child can have advice for the parent. That's possible. Like Ibrahim salam, had advice for his father. That can happen. That can and it happened in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam. Sahaba gave advice to their parents. That happened. And then there are, there are times where you can give advice to the elder and the elder will give advice to you. And no one of them is positioned, sitting on top of a mountain called Al-Haq. That they own it and that's why they're dishing it out to everybody else. That's not how that works. What tawasaw bil haq has humility in it, has mutual love and care in it. So when we listen to these guidelines in the Quran, I pray that we are able to internalize the deep wisdom in them and the genuine concern we're supposed to have for each other and the, the eagerness we're supposed to have to get closer and closer and closer to the truth as we travel through this journey of life. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us sincere towards the words of Allah. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who when we do Amr bin Ma'roof, when we do Nahi al Munkar and we do Tawasi bil Haqq and Tawasi bil Sabr, that we do it in a way that is pleasing to Allah and actually in accordance with the Sunnah of His Messenger. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyakum bil ayati wa dhikr. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasul Allah. Haya ala salat, haya ala falah. قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استقيموا يرحمكم الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين ولله ما في السماوات والأرض وإلى الله ترجع الأمور
كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله ولو آمن أهل الكتاب لكان خيرا لهم منهم المؤمنون منهم المؤمنون وأكثرهم الفاسقون لن يضروكم إلا أذى وإن يقاتلوكم يولوكم الأدبار ثم لا ينصرون الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر الله I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Qur'an all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Qur'an. We are students of the Qur'an ourselves and we want you to be students of the Qur'an alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Qur'an a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Qur'an beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.